Good afternoon from the KBR at the Fundación Mafra in Barcelona, where we opened two new shows this week, Wine Grand, which is where we are now, and Nicholas Nixon at the Spy 2, which will be the talk of next Thursday. Um, we're lucky today because we've got Drew Sawyer here with us, the curator of this exhibition. He's an art historian and one of the uh, leading curators in his generation. He has a long uh, career, but uh, I will highlight some of his latest projects like After Arts, Arts after Stonewall, 1979, 1989, I too have seen America, the Harlem Renaissance, and uh, other shows, but he's here today because of one of his latest projects, which was the show that he organized at the Brooklyn Museum. He's the curator for photography there on Gary Winogrand in 2019. That uh, show was, might seem incredible, but it was the first exhibition of the color photo photography of Gary, Gary with a selection of his slides based on the 45,000 slides that are kept in the um, archives of the author. And uh, it was very successful and it offered a new look at the uh, work of uh, Winogrand a master of Nosotros color, también en la and que uh, we at the show that we're, that we're inaugurating this week here are presenting for the first time in Spain 160 of those slides that can be seen at the show. And uh, Drew Sawyer is going to do an introduction on the uh, work of Wiener Grand, but uh, we, will away, we will also have uh, a conversation with another two artists born in Brooklyn, like Wiener Grand of later generations to talk about the legacy of Juana Grande in contemporary Joseph photography, Rodriguez Joseph Sacha Rodriguez Fias and Sasha Fias uh, Burgess. Eh, and bueno, I'm now going to pass the floor to Drew, and I remind you that you can leave your questions Zoom, in the chat y que, eh, section, and you can also choose the language that you want to follow at the bottom. There's a menu with an icon for interpretation you can select your language. So without further ado, thank you to our guests, thank you to Drew, and I'm going to pass, going to pass the plot to you. You're looking fresh in spite of jet lag, uh, and I hope we can uh, get this going right away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Carlos, for that introduction. Um, I couldn't understand most of it, unfortunately, but I caught, I caught bits because I speak a little Spanish, but um, I'm gonna give a quick introduction to the exhibition um, and then we'll introduce my two uh, guest speakers as well and join and they'll join for a conversation. Um, so I'm gonna start a, a PowerPoint presentation first and then, and then give um, introductions. Um, but I do just want to thank everyone at the Mopfrey Foundation again for all of their assistance. And it's been such a pleasure to work with them on, on this show and project, um, especially over the course of the pandemic, which certainly didn't make organizing an exhibition and installing an exhibition um, when I live uh, uh, in New York and, and the show is here in Barcelona, um, very easy. Um, so as Carlos mentioned, uh, in 2019 at the Brooklyn Museum, I organized uh, the exhibition Gary Winogrand Color, which was the first show to consider Winogrand's color work. Um, and right, I mean, I, I, I thought a lot about what, what, what is there left to say about somebody like Gary Winogrand. The Brooklyn Museum has a collection of about 125 black and white photographs. So. Um, the show sort of emerged um, from actually my job interview at, at the museum and thinking about um, given the sort of size of the museum's collection um, and a desire to do something collection-based, what, what, what could one do that would contribute um, to a conversation around Wintergrand? So um, I proposed a show looking into his color work, which I already knew um, Susan Kismeric, a, a curator, former curator at MoMA, and Michael Almereda, a filmmaker, were already working on a book project. 
Um, so I sort of part, I brought them in to the full, invited them to work with me uh, and uh, came up with the idea of doing a slideshow installation. Uh, and that's partially because in 1967 at the Museum of Modern Art, John Tcherkowski organized uh, an exhibition, uh, New Documents, uh, which included Winogrand's work along with Dan Arbus uh, and Lee Friedlander. Uh, and of course, as you can see from the installation shot, uh, mostly included his black and white work. But if you look into the back, you can see a slide projector, which included his color work. Um, sort of uh, infamously, the color projector malfunctioned as slide projectors often do still today, <laughs> maybe even more so. Um, and it was removed from the exhibition. So unfortunately, not many people even saw that, uh, saw that installation or the color work. And Winogrand, although he had shot um, color work basically from the early 1950s um, onward, basically abandoned color work um, around uh, shortly after that, that presentation. Um, so that, that sort of idea to present a slideshow was based on the only way that Winogrand presented the work um, during his lifetime, uh, which was largely, I, I think it was for my framing of that exhibition was, is important to acknowledge Winogrand's own class position. He was a first generation Jewish American who was born and raised in the Bronx uh, in a working class neighborhood. He certainly didn't have the resources to, um, to produce and print uh, color work, which was uh, exorbitantly more expensive than, than black and white, uh, 100 to 200 times more expensive in the 1960s. Um, and and so, um, so for me, that was a really important part of the narrative too, of considering why, why is this work not as well known? Why, why didn't Winogrand show it more often? Um, uh, and you know, as I said, it's important to acknowledge that Winogrand began shooting color when he began basically shooting black and white. He was working for magazines in the 1950s. Um, and as many magazine photographers did, they shot in color. So here's two examples of Sports Illustrated covers um, that are also included in the exhibition uh, of, some of, his, of some of his color work. Um, but um, so, so the idea, so I sort of proposed that idea, which required a lot of research. It meant sifting through 50,000 uh, uh, Kodachrome slides in his archives at the CCP. Uh, and um, so here I'm just showing a selection of some of those slides as they exist in the archive. Um, and because Winogrand, you know, we don't have a record of what was included in new documents. Um, I had to base it on um, a couple of different uh, indicators. One was if he made a duplicate. So you can see there's a, um, it says if, if the slide is a duplicate sl slide was made from a, another original slide. Um, if he marked on it, if he signed it, if he stamped it. Um, so that was some of the way that I, that from the 50,000 Kodachrome slides that I selected a presentation that there were then uh, digitized uh, and um, presented as a slideshow. Uh, the show did include one slide projector, which thankfully didn't malfunction, or at least not to my <laughs> knowledge, but <laughs> potentially our, our, our AV staff had to deal with, uh, with malfunctions. But um, uh, but the main exhibition hall included 16 projectors um, with around 500 images. Again, still just a fraction because it was selected from 50, about 50,000 um, Kodachrome slides. Um, so, so for me, it was a way to sort of right, think, about, um, think about an unknown part of Winogrand's career, um, but also the impact of his color work on a new generation of photographers who uh, he served as mentors too, including William Eggleston, Mitch Epstein, um, uh, photographers in the 1970s when color, ph color photography became um, somewhat ch cheaper um, that who were allowed to really develop and explore that. Uh, and Winogrand taught um, at Cooper Union uh, courses on color photography where he brought in William Eggleston. Um, Mitch Epstein says it's, you know, that's where he really started exploring color. So that was sort of um, another installation shot. Um, so that was sort of the, the premise of that show. So when I was approached about uh, doing an exhibition for Mopfrey, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to sort of expand upon that and really think about the color work in context with Winogrand's other work. Um, and so the, the exhibition at, at Mopfrey is really, um, you know, the color work is sort of at the center and there's a reduced, checklist of, of the color work, it's, it's three projectors, but still about 150 images uh, as opposed to 16 projectors. Um, but the rest of the show is really organized um, also around Winogrand's relationship, working relationship 
and friendship with John Tcharkowski, who was the curator of photography um, from the 19, early 1960s until um, the early 1990s at the Museum of Modern Art. And you know, I think really there's, there's not a, an easy way of understanding Winogrand's work without understanding the framework that Tchaikovsky um, gave audiences and scholars, critics for, for understanding it. Um, so yeah, here's a, a, a self-portrait that Winogrand took uh, with, uh, of, uh, in color, and then a photograph actually that Lee Friedlander took of Gary Winogrand taking a photograph of, uh, of John Tchaikovsky. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of the sections um, and thinking about that sort of relationship. So early work, as I mentioned, um, Winogrand started as, uh, as a magazine sort of freelance commercial photographer. Um, and, um, and he was, of course, shooting also in black and white. Here is sort of two examples. Uh, uh, one image uh, shows the Metrop Metropolitan Opera. Already he's shooting in a, with a 35 millimeter lens, of course, um, uh, a 35 millimeter, sorry, film, um, and uh, sort of using a very sort of spontaneous um, uh, composition and style to sort of capture, in this case, a couple enjoying uh, sh champagne. Uh, and then a photograph of uh, JFK at the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 1960, um, where I think what's interesting about this picture is it's, he's already thinking about how, how images mediate our understanding of the world. And that will be a through line, I think, for a lot of his work um, throughout, the, throughout his life, thinking about um, the role of images um, as, as mediating our, 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 our knowledge and experiences. So here, right, it's a picture of Kennedy, but we actually don't see Kennedy's face. It's a picture of his back. The only, the only way we see his face is through the television set. Um, uh, and then, you know, he, he also made a number of photographs at Coney Island. Uh, an article was published in Collier magazine in 1955. Um, and if uh, for the color work, there's a large section that it also includes um, Coney Island pictures to show that he was really thinking and uh, thinking about color um, simultaneously with black and white from the very beginning of his career. Um, but I think for both Tarkowski and Winogrand, it's important to think about the context that they were pushing against. So. Um, Tchaikovsky, who became the director of photography at MoMA in 1962. Um, his predecessor was Edward Steikens, whose um, probably most well-known show was The Family of Man, um, which opened at the Museum of Modern Art in 1955, a sort of sweeping thematic humanistic survey uh, using photography to, to tell a very sort of universal uh, story about mankind. Um, it included Winogrand's photograph of the couple at the beach that I just showed sort of frolicking in a wave, which you can see in the background. Um, so already Winogrand, right, was working within a magazine context and working within the sort of context that Edward Steichen was pursuing about photography, which was a very sort of narrative, um, some might say propagandistic uh, form uh, of, of of exhibition making um, or of framing photography in a similar way to magazines. Um, so, so they were both sort of coming out of that context and really pushing it against it. So um, that's one of the through lines of, of the exhibition and thinking about especially their, their sort of relationship and partnership is pushing against the sort of narrative, so the narrative surrounding photography to just think about uh, the photographs themselves um, as, as pictures and not as records necessarily of the world. Um, so actually, so the first show that John Tcharkowski did at, at MoMA, one of the first shows that Tcharkowski did at MoMA in 1963 uh, was called Five Unrelated Photographers, right? Which is a direct response clearly to the very thematic uh, exhibitions that Edward Steichen was doing. He was signaling to audiences that I'm not gonna do these big narrative exhibitions. These are just five photographers that are totally unrelated that I, I'm interested in. And amongst those was Gary Winogrand. So from the very beginning of Tchaikovsky's career, um, a lot of his own ideas about the medium of photography were expressed through Winogrand's work. Um, that these really include um, a lot of, uh, you know, what are considered, you know, sort of signature Winogrand images today taken on the streets in New York City um, in the early 1960s. Um, and I think what's also interesting about the installation is that already this sort of 
great number of images is prioritized over the singular image for Winogrand. Of course, he was extremely prolific. And even at this early stage, it wasn't about the single image, but about the, the sort of mass of images um, that he took. Um, uh, and so also at this, uh, also at this stage, you know, Winogrand and Tchaikovsky's ideas about photography were, were developing, again, in sort of reaction um, to those previous modes, but also a sort of social documentary mode, which had been in dominance um, in the 1930s and 1940s, especially, and then sort of photojournalism, both which are, you know, telling stories through, through photographs and the framing of, of, of additional text. And here, right, we have, uh, which is, this was the accompanying text that Winogrand, Winogrand wrote for that, um, for that exhibition that was on the wall, where he really is talking about, in a way, medium specificity, right? A very modernist idea of what photography is. It's not painting, it's not poetry, he says, uh, not anything but photography itself. Um, and, and really together they develop that idea of what, what it is. And it's, I would argue it's not quite modernism because they're not talking about light uh, in the way that right, photography is all about light and chemical processes. They're talking about images, uh, about representation, and they're thinking critically about um, what a picture is and what a picture isn't, and how a picture, a photograph, is not a, a, a real transcription of the world, right? But it's filtered through a particular subject. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, perfect example of Winogrand street photography from the 1960s and 70s in New York City. Um, right, the ways in which he's indicating that this is a subjective medium. We have uh, his use of a wide angle lens, which includes a lot of visual information within a single picture. He's tilting the picture plane, which again indicates that this is not um, some sort of, a, a, even, even though he says the camera is a machine, it's automatic, right? Yeah, this, is, this is being wielded by somebody. Um, and he's indicating that through the sort of, yeah, tilting the picture plane. Uh, but also the sort of like, you know, juxtaposition and random visual poetry that, you know, tells a story, but doesn't really, it leaves it up to uh, the viewer to sort of decide. So here we have um, these four women who somehow magically seem to be, um, their feet seem to be dancing syncopated together uh, and their forms are mirrored by these trash bags to the side. Um, behind them is a group of younger women whose clothing, right, differs radically. Uh, she's wearing a t-shirt with pants, has long hair, um, uh, and there's a dog going to the bathroom, right? So they're just, he packs it with visual information that, that leads to all these potential stories that one could, put, that one could um, imagine when looking at this photograph. Um, another main part of the exhibition um, is around the year 1964, when he receives his first Guggenheim uh, Fellowship, a very prestigious award. Um, and uh, that uh, he really um, uh, is, is desiring to make a sort of picture of the United States, again, in reaction to the media, something he himself, he acknowledges was sort of guilty of, of fabricating an idealized image of the United States. And you can imagine this is the year of Kennedy's assassination. It's the beginning of the Vietnam War. Um, it's the sort of height of the civil rights movement. Um, there's, there's so many things that Winogrand himself becomes disillusioned with. Um, and he really travels across the country to sort of find a way to sort of picture what he imagines to be a, a more maybe honest or empathetic or maybe, or, and humorous picture of the United States at the time. Um, but again, you know, thinking, I mean, the, the photograph uh, of, of Dallas in the plaza where JFK was murdered is showing, um, assassinated is showing all the way in which that site is already being monetized. It's a tourist destination, people are selling postcards. But again, this idea of the way in which photography mediates our understanding of the world is really sort of central um, to, to that. Um, I think, you know, he's looking at uh, suburbia, isolation, consumerism, car culture, all of these things, um, but not in a, not in a uh, right, he's not a social documentarian, right? He's pushing against that. So he's not trying to change the world in the way that maybe other photographers were doing, or he, and he's not trying to narrate the world in a specific way, but, but really just, do what photography does, which is record visual information uh, and, and give that without a framework because he, if anything, is critical of the idea that photographs can really provide any true um, narrative. 
Um, I'm going to quickly go, but so uh, because I want to get to the conversation too. I was maybe too ambitious with with covering all this, but um, another section is on animals, um, which is was the first monographic, uh, first solo exhibition that Turkowski organized of Winogrand's work at MoMA in 1969. It was also a book, and it included work that he had produced um, in the 1960s at zoos and aquariums in New York City's, um, and uh, you know I think. Winogrand's work has, was often seen as sort of apolitical, but I, I think when you look at this series, when you look at a lot of his work, you can sort of, again, this sort of read um, elements of confinement um, that correspond maybe to various other sort of social confinements that were happening in the decade. Um, certainly, right, the picture of the sort of wolf behind bars mirrors the image of this man talking to a woman um, as a sort of perhaps a predator. Um, uh, another, another section of the exhibition is Society of the Spectacle, which, look, which looks at Winogrand's work um, uh, beginning in 1969 when he received his second, second Guggenheim Fellowship uh, to look at the way, the effect of the media on society. And again, really a through line is thinking about how media mediates right, our, our understanding of the world. Um, so really trying to expose um, the workings of the media. It was uh, eventually became a, a book and an exhibition at MoMA, uh, Public Relations, which was organized um, by Todd Papa George, a fellow photographer who then became a professor at Yale and became also very influential. Um, uh, and here you can see sort of, right, he's showing specific events that were designed to be photographed by the media uh, and sort of exposing the apparatus of, of the media. Um, other things are sort of public events that uh, weren't necessarily designed for the media, but people were very aware of how those events might be photographed, whether they were protests uh, or other public gathering during the 1960s and 70s. Um, and finally, the last body of work looks at his time in Texas and California. Um, uh, Winogrand left New York around 1970s, took a number of itinerant sort of teaching jobs before settling in Austin in 1973. Um, and was teaching at uh, the University of Texas. Uh, and so this body of work, um, it includes photographs that he took in Texas during that time in 1978. He, he receives his third Guggenheim Fellowship uh, oh, wow. and moves to, uh, moves to California. It's supposed to be a study about California. So he moves to California um, and starts producing pictures. Um, and unfortunately, uh, Winogrand, um, uh, develops gallbladder cancer in 1984 uh, and passes away quite suddenly. Um, so a lot of this work, as many people know, was actually never developed, right? He, he had shot thousands of rolls of films that were never, never developed. And it was actually, once again, John Tchaikovsky who uh, developed that work after he passed away uh, and then included a slideshow of that, um, of that work in his um, survey exhibition in 1988. So as again, one of the sort of through lines, as I said, of the show is that they're sort of really close working relationship. And my argument would be that I, th I think um, uh, it's hard to sort of pull apart their own ideas about photography. This sort of one, one and the other in definitely influenced each other. But I think that context um, uh, is important for understanding Winogrand's work and, and the context in which he was working within and against during the 1960s and 70s. Although, of course, you know, I think viewers can, um, I'm sure, you know, especially with 50 years removed and a sort of sense of, in some cases, nostalgia, maybe for some, um, can be interested in all the minutia that Winogrand was able to photograph. Because I think one of the things, at least, that Winogrand really did with John Tchaikovsky was pushing the limits of what was a recognizable fine art photograph, um, both in terms of style and in terms of content, um, really opened up the possibilities of what, what photographers could do, uh, which included right, photographing nearly anything um, and everything. Um, so that's my really, really quick um, introduction and overview of the exhibition. Um, I'm going to now introduce um, uh, the two artists who would be joining me today. I'm really excited to be in conversation with them about their, their own work as well as thinking about um, some of the questions that sort of come out of Winogrand's work and especially thinking about Winogrand um, today. Um, so first um, I'm going to introduce uh, Joseph Rodriguez um, who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York uh, where I am, I am now based. Um, 
And over the past 30 years, uh, Rodriguez uh, has received numerous awards and has published and exhibited widely. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through his entire CV. Um, he is the author, I'll, I'll give a couple examples of his books though, but he is the author of Spanish Harlem, uh, which was published by the National Museum of American Art and DAP, uh, as well as the author of East Side Stories, Gang Life in East Los Angeles, um, uh, and uh, Juvenile Flesh Life in Mexico City, uh, and still here stories after Katrina. And last year he published the monograph Taxi, which I think he's gonna talk a little bit about today, uh, which are photographs that he made in the late 70s and, and uh, 1980s um, in New York City while working as a taxi driver as well. Um, it's also my pleasure to have Sasha Fires Burgess, who also happened to be born in Brooklyn, born and raised in Brooklyn. That was not uh, not intentional. I wasn't thinking about uh, oh, you know, having to. I wasn't raised in Brooklyn. I was just born oh. there. Okay, sorry. Thank you for correcting. So born in Brooklyn. Oh, I think, yes, you, you were raised in Massachusetts. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay, I don't, all right, moving on. Um, after graduating from Bard College, she went on to earn an MFA at Cornell University. Um, and uh, has been a resident at the Center for Photography at Woodstock um, and has exhibited her work at numerous galleries. Um, she was uh, recently the winner of the uh, DeMeyer Fellowship from Columbia College and the Capricious Photo Award from Capricious Publishing in New York, which also just earlier this year published her first monograph, Untitled. Um, so it's my pleasure to have you both here and thank you again for agreeing to be part of this conversation. Thanks for um, having Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I thought maybe, maybe Joseph, I thought we could start with you, um, <laughs> just given one that you were actually, you know, you sort of started uh, photographing while Wintergrand uh, was still alive. So in just a direct context, maybe a little bit more, um, at least a proximity to Wintergrand's, um, Wintergrand's work. Um, so um, here I can bring up uh, Taxi, which is the book. So yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to, your own thoughts about you know working and thinking about Wintergram, but also just more broadly um, thinking about you know the sort of what I was laying out this idea of of Wintergram and Tchaikovsky Char really um, you know it, one of the things that they were doing at the time is trying to expand what was photographable and expand what was a recognizable style of, of a photograph that would be in a museum context, right? Um, that would be recognized as an art, or an art photograph, whatever that might be, rather than say a photojournalistic uh, image. Right. Well, I mean, to, just to start, I mean, I, photography came to me as, as a savior, I was, growing up in the hard streets of New York. I mean, I kind of grew up in the old classic naked city novel film noir film that really was part of my life. I mean, that's the way I grew up. The tough streets of New York is the, and, and similar to the way Gary Winogrand grew up in the Bronx, you, you really had to know how to take care of yourself. So I guess a lot of that internal sort of growing up, it got me, to photograph in a certain way, in a certain style. I'm at the International Center of Photography for most of this photog photographic work. I'm studying and I'm, we're, we're learning so much about, there's so much discourse about Gary Wayne Grant's pictures. I mean, a lot. <laughs> so, so I got very familiar with his work while we were at ICP, for sure. And now I have to go and for, for me personally, trying to find my, my way, my voice, you know, I come out of the New York school. I'm, I'm studying the New York school guys, right? So who are they? The Sid Grossman, Lizette Modell. You know, I've got to walk in these shadows of Gary Winogrand, all these great photographers. So I, I trying to find my own way through. And, and, and because I was trapped into this job because I needed to eat and pay my rent, the only time I had to photograph was while I was working. So it, it, it wasn't by choice that I chose this, this project, but it was a wonderful way for me, knowing and growing up in New York City, I know my city well, I was a bike messenger. So I knew the boroughs, I knew the areas, like this is Houston and, and the Bowery, right? And 
it wasn't unusual for us to see what we see today in terms of homeless people. So I was just trying to see what I saw out of the cab in a way that Gary would do it on his feet, so to speak. He was always running around with that, with two or three Leicas on his neck. And I only had one camera. And so it became this kind of voyage in a way. So I've got a lot of sort of Magnum tradition in my back of my head. I've got Ouija. I've got all these people that I'm trying to see how I can create. But I, I went a little bit further. I remember seeing some of Gary's work uh, around Christopher Street. He was photographing on the street. Um, and, you know, I had friends that were gay. My brother was a DJ. So, you know, on my coffee break time, because I'm still a cab driver here, but I would go and grab a beer. And this was a, a club called the Fabric Factory. And men came to to on a Friday night and got dressed up, even with their wives. You know, it was today. It's kind of normal for this conversation. <laughs> but this was kind of interesting for me and sparked a little by Gary sort of uh, some of his work. So um, and, you know, I just sort of drove all throughout the city and because Gary was always on his feet running around. I mean, I've seen every film about the man. <laughs> he was the most, one of the most physical photographers I, I, that I can remember. So, but I was trapped. So I was just here and, and I just photographed what I saw. Morning and night, you know, I began my shift at 4 a.m. in the morning, my garage, that I was working was on 15th Street and 9th Avenue, uh, right in the heart of Chelsea. And a lot of trans sex workers were all over my, our cabs doing their business. So that was the first group of people that I would meet at 4 a.m. in the morning. So, um, and that's how the connections become. The Anvil, the very famous Anvil, which was a gay sort of all night after hour club that would and probably about 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, here I am waiting on cue, meaning waiting for a fair, because the big fairs at 6 a.m., 5 a.m., 4 a.m. were, were going to be from downtown straight uptown. And a lot of gay men that I would pick up lived uptown. So I was just on cue here, and these two young men were outside talking to each other, but they didn't know each other, but they just finished sort of taking care of their personal urination business against the wall and they struck up a conversation. So it was just kind of, yeah. And then, you know, I was up in Harlem on 125th street. It was Harlem week in August and uh, it was beautiful. And, you know, I was just going real slow. And then I stopped the cab because sometimes I, many times I would stop and have a coffee break. And to be quite honest with the viewers, I didn't make that much money, folks. <laughs> I was out there trying to make pictures most of the time. So, but moving around, you got to see a lot. Rushing back to Brooklyn on the Manhattan Bridge as the sun was coming up uh, with a fare. And uh, time is money. Very different way of uh, transportation today with Uber, which everything is very slow. And, you know, us taxi drivers had to really hustle a lot. It's, I'm, I'm curious, did you, were you that familiar with Wintergrand's photo apps that he made um, on his cross country trips from his, like through his car? Well, I was just, I was just being introduced to some of that work, yeah. you know, and because this is, all right, just to explain to the viewers, you know, we're in school, ICP is a very, was a very different kind of school back then. It was more of a museum school, more like RISD, right? Where, where Nan Golden studied. And, and so it was really seven days a week we were in school. So we got a lot to see all the time. And every time there was a, a new chapter, for example, I love the way you broke down the exhibition into chapters. You know, we looked at the Central Park, the zoo work, the work he did around there. We looked at the feminist sort of mo uh, the, 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 the moments of the day during feminism and what was happening, the, the dread, you know, the mode, the clothes, the strength of a woman, the way she walked down Fifth Avenue. All of these were being sort of discussed in class. So um, it was it was quite an eye opener for me, big time and still overwhelmed. Uh, by his, his prolific work. Um, you know, we're on a, on a, this is Houston Street, right across the street from the famous Film Forum Art Cinema. Maybe a lot of the folks have been downtown. Uh, and this was an after hour club 
um, and and after after hour club. This would open up at about six seven in the morning, and then close maybe two in the afternoon. So this is probably early morning, and just waiting for a fare. And a lot of trans sort of sex workers would go there, the bartenders, the DJs, you know. It was also the time of cocaine, right? So the Studio 54 days, so there's a lot of partying going on days at a time. We we're on 58th Street and, and uh, near Lexington Avenue, I believe. Yeah, um, I believe so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I would stop. We had these, these taxi stands that were around the city. And, you know, they were usually next to a little coffee shop or something. And I'd stop and grab a coffee. But I always had my camera on my shoulder and looking, you know. This was a Gary, Gary Winogrand influenced image for me, right? Can I get that close? Can I, can I capture a moment, right? Or an emotion, yeah. So I wouldn't say he was the only photographer, but he was, he, his, his work was, you know, premier for us, yeah. Um, a family, you know, I, you know, the taxi world is a very strange world uh, when you drive at night, uh, Drew, because what had happened was I had just dropped this, this couple who was in my cab, um, if I have time to talk about it, it was, you know, and I, I'm crossing the park, I'm taking them to the east side, I cross the transverse at Central Park, 66th Street, I get to the corner and I see everybody staring at my cab and they were having sex in the back seat. And it was just kind of a moment that was kind of not nice because, you know, that would have been okay, but you know, they didn't ask and stuff. And so I had to stop, clean the cab out and clean everything up. Right. And then the next fair was this beautiful <laughs> family going to church. That's New York. That's, that was, that was my New York. So and that was that was a real moment, you know, that I wish I could have captured both. But it, yeah, this was for me a beautiful moment. So we're back at the fabric factory. Right. I mean, we're it's a Friday night. A lot of working men, folks. Some of them were policemen. Some of them were firemen. Some of them just, you know, and they, some of the wives were very cool with them and get dressed up in drag, right? Um, and this was just one of those nights. So, you know, I'm just honoring what I see. And uh, ask, always asking people, is it okay? If, I can put, if I'm that close, I'm gonna ask you if it's okay. Yeah. Um, this was another, that was another club that was, you know, an all nighter. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff going on downstairs there. Yeah, it's a BDSM you know, sadomasochistic kind of people would get dressed up and, you know, do all this hanky panky. I'm trying to keep it light here for the audience, but you know, a lot of hanky panky sexual stuff going on there. Yeah. And then I would pick them up, which is, for me, what was really interesting was um, I was very nervous and very insecure as a photographer to photograph people. So the framing of the window became a kind of shield for me, right? Right. I got the car door there. Right. He doesn't see me. They don't see me. I'm photographing what I see. Right. And it wasn't until I uh, which I think is important for me to mention wasn't until I had a workshop uh, at ICP with Mary Ellen Mark when she was looking at or if you want to hold on to that, we can hold on to it for another you tell me which. How do oh you yeah, I was gonna say we. I wanted to come back to sort of um, right, just maybe discussing after we can look sure. at some of Sasha's work, thinking I'll let about. You it. Okay. Yeah, sort of thinking about the ethics, but I, but I, I do want to. I'm just curious um, because I, you know, it's really interesting, right? That this this body of work is essentially framed by your job, right? It's it's right. it's a project that is around labor, your labor in a certain way, and that really structures the way the photographs look, obviously, right? You're shooting through your, through your car because you're, that's your job, um, but also your relationship to the world and the subjects, um, right? Are, well, in some cases, obviously people are in your car and you have a more sort of direct relationship with them, but that's still a, a, a sort of, that's an exchange of, for money, right? You're providing a service. Sure. Um, uh, and so I'm curious, but you, this, this book came out last, the earlier or last year. 
It just um, came out of December, actually. Um, so was it was it work that you you and maybe this will be the next question that we can return to? But sure. I'm just curious: was it work that you sort of distanced yourself from, and you, you know, sort of was, went back to it, or? Well, I, I you know I learned from Gio Perez, who's very close. I'm very close to. We're not close as friends, but you know he he would always and Gene and Susan a lot of magnum. You have to revisit your work over time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this is the last frames were 1987. You know, from here, I'm already working in Spanish Harlem. I'm working for National Geographic. I'm becoming a little bit about what Gary was doing, learning how to eat and be a photojournalist. Right. So there was this constant push pull with me trying to find my voice. Should I be, you know, because the, the photographer that really kicked my butt was a, a photographic show I saw when I was in my teenage years called Lewis Hine at the Brooklyn Museum. And that was my connection to photography and that humanistic, very close portraiture style that I always wanted to, but I needed to sort of, so there was this push pull of like close, not close. How do we get to, where, what's, what's your voice? What do you want to say? So a lot of this is experimental photography for me, to be quite honest, as a student. Mm. Right. Well, uh, yeah. So we'll we'll come back to the sort of the ethics question, which I think is what you were going to go to with the Mary Ellen Mark. Um, and and so now I want to sort of turn to Sasha, and we'll, we can go through some of your work. But again, sort of thinking about you know, I'm just curious, and it doesn't have to be you know. And part of the reason I was you know I'm, I'm a admirer of your work, so I was I wanted to have a conversation um, because I don't know you know I don't know to what degree. Winogrand interests you at all, um, and so, but but I guess the question that I it's this question that I asked was more so about the way I framed the Winogrand show, which was this idea of one's one's desire to expand what is photographable, or and sort of that that expansion as you know an approach to photography, or what motivates I think a lot of photographers is is. Um, doing something that they don't see. So obviously that's, that often all, also involves pushing against um, what comes before, um, which obviously Wintergrand did. And then obviously, you know, by the seventies, given the stature of Wintergrand and John Tcharkowski, they became, they themselves became the people that pushed against and they, right. And I think about um, more so maybe in relation to Sasha's work, um, right, the, the emergence, especially in the late 1960s and 1970s towards a very sort of personal narrative about photography. Many people turn to family life, many people turn to friends, these, this sort of, um, uh, which was obviously a, really a reaction to um, Tchaikovsky's framing and Winogrand's framing of, of, of what, was, what was deemed an appropriate sort of style or subject matter for, for art. So yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious, um, your thoughts about that and thinking about some of your work. Yeah, I mean, I photograph mainly, uh, my interests are mainly within the African diaspora, but it's really interesting to hear this conversation and realize how small the world of photography is because I went to Bard College and that Bard College was, you know, a photography program that was really run by a lot of the New York City photographers that had studied under like Lizette Modell and all of them. So it's, I, of course I know Gary Winograd photographs that I'm quite fond of. There's also critiques that I have as with everything. But I will say that it's interesting to like a, a photographer that came out of that school that I feel like I'm much more aligned with is Larry Fink, who, um, who I taught with, who taught me at uh, Bard College and who I then worked for afterwards. And I feel like there's a certain type of kinetic energy that um, like New York City photographers has. That's why I wanted to be clear that I wasn't raised in New York. I was just born there because I think, especially listening to Joseph talk about New York, this is kind of like, I think I was taking from that energy, but I wasn't necessarily there always growing up and things like that. So, I mean, I'm influenced by the, the work of, especially the partnership between John Tcharkowski and Gary Winogrand, because I think that those people then went into the academy and then the academy then taught people like me. And so because of that, I have this in my lineage, but I think also because of that, and because I'm from like another gen, like a, yeah, like another generation, I, I'm prone to critiquing 
as with I think that happens with every successive group of people, you know? So like for me, the Gary Winogrand work, I always think of that, uh, I think it's from Anna, the photograph of that famous boxer and his wife and, the, and he, they're holding a monkey. His wife is white and the boxer is black. And that kind of makes me think about this, like the, the social, the social moment, the, the kind of conversation that's happening socially. And then I also think about women are beautiful. One of my favorite Gary Winogrand photographs ever is that photograph of the three women walking down the street and there's the light coming behind them. And then there's the man in the wheelchair and then there's two, here's a, a father, I mean, I don't know, a family sitting on a bench yep. and like just looking at the, um, like the commentary on the street, you know, street life. But then I also have to think about women are beautiful in the context of the feminist movement that was also saying at that time, what does it mean for, you know, a man to essentially stop or graph them? I don't know, you know, I can't necessarily give like, um, it's just like my understanding of, of the world very varied, I think. And I think that I'm, I'm also working in a similar, or a photographer that really knocked me out too was Lewis Hine, because that was like, I just didn't know that you could do those things with photography. And once I knew, it kind of opened up a world for me. Because, right, because you tend to, or this sort of selection of images, maybe we can go through some of them, but um, um, right, there's sort of this sort of portraiture style that Hein really practiced where the, oftentimes the subject is centered, they're usually oftentimes looking directly at the camera. So there really is that relationship between the photographer and the person or the people that are being um, pictured. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of these people in the images are my family. This is my cousin, Joey. We look just alike, you know, and then other of these people are people that I'm meeting along the way. So I think also this is a photograph that I took on the road trip. I took Greyhound buses across the country. And I think in that way, when I did this, I was also curious about like this mode of transportation and who took it socially, like who takes the bus? I grew up taking the bus in and out of New York City all of the time. So my relationship to New York City was like, I was a weekend warrior, you know, I had family and stuff there, but I was going in on the weekends, on the bus all the time, all the time. So there's a particular group of people in America that ride the bus, like socioeconomic group of people that ride the bus. And for me, riding the bus across America was a way for me to explore or understand the parts of America that I don't think I was necessarily um, always we seeing reflected back at me in the same way. Yeah, this is a, a so this is a photograph of my grandmother in Trinidad. And um, so yes, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. I was born, born in a uh, Kings County Hospital uh, in a uh, primarily West Indian, English speaking West Indian, weren't, um, so Trinidadians, St. Lucians, Bayesians, Jamaicans. Um, and so for me, that was like an epicenter of like the African diaspora. And then where I grew up, there was a lot of Puerto Ricans. And so I began understanding kind of like where I grew up was predominantly white. And then once I like kind of moved on, there was, you know, more Puerto Rican people. And I began to understand that what the African diaspora meant essentially. And where we existed. And then that became an interest for me. So another bus. Well, maybe this sort of leads to um, the next question, which is really about this sort of thinking about, um, and you already sort of touched upon it, both of you, but the sort of ethics of photography and how they've changed, especially since the 1960s um, uh, in photographic discourse. Um, and especially, you know, in terms of photographing strangers or individuals on the street who might not be aware or might not, you know, have consent. And of course, many photographers today, you know, use consent forms whenever they're photographing individuals. Um, but also just thinking, yeah, about, and I know, right, you, you um, I, I've read or, you know, I've seen some talks you've done, um, Sasha, where you talk about, you know, the first time going to Trinidad and making photographs that even though, right, your, your parents are, fr or you have family there, but you, you didn't grow up there. So what kind of permission or relationship do you have to mm -hmm. a place? Um, and what sort of, yeah, right do, do you have to go in there and, and, and photograph it? 
Um, so yeah, so I thought both of you, um, maybe, yeah, it would be interesting to hear both of your thoughts or the way, the way you've approached it um, in your own work. Um, Joseph, you Sasha, or, yeah, whoever. Uh, you want me to go first or, or should, Sasha, Sasha, why don't you, since we got your work up, do you want to pick up on that or do you want me to? Okay, I'll start. Um, I think that these are questions that I still don't quite know how to answer uh, as we like, there was a point in t photographing in public spaces, I think has merit, particularly like, especially looking at the work, like Joseph's work and thinking about like the New York City and those photographs is the city that I, I grew up hearing about. That's the New York City that I wanted to be in all the time. And so I think that being able and, and I really find it interesting that it was taxi cab because I felt like there was a time when that was like the mode of transportation, you know, that's how people were really traveling. Like you, I mean, I remember being a kid and taking the dollar cab and taking different cabs like that when I was with my family. That was the way that you got places, <laughs> you know? I'm Sorry, I gotta laugh for the little dollar cab people here, folks. Sorry, Drew. <laughs> Up and down flat with you having <laughs> So like that to see New York City from that angle really for me speaks about a certain time and also to also see the, the type of New York City in which um, queer and uh, trans people or people that are seeing and different things like that were living in a different kind of way is really important. But I know that those photographs that you were taking at the bar were the photographs that you were asking people. But I think that there is something important about photographing in the street. That being said, people, and I'll be very specific, I think a lot of photographers, uh, white photographers have been photographing people of color without their consent and making things and stories and telling stories about people that they could have done themselves. The Family Man exhibition is a great one. I think there were like two photographers of color or three photographers of color and one guy from Kenya like protested at it, you know? And so that's, a, that's where issues of consent and where questions of, well, who, who's representing whom and what is the, what is the, the worthiness of this represent, or I don't wanna say worthiness, what is the, the point, the merit of this representation? I think that's when those questions become more important. I'm not quite, I, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I'm trying a thing and I, I ask, sometimes I don't ask, I'm, I think I'm trying to understand the African diaspora, both from a public and private point of view. That's great. Um, um, so you want me to pick up, Drew? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah well, okay. I was, uh, okay, great, sorry. Well, I was um, just gonna quickly say, I mean, it does, please. you know, it, it does seem like many, many of your pictures obviously are these sort of, as I was saying, the sort of connection to Lewis Hine, these where, where the individuals or, or people that you're photographing acknowledge your presence, right? They're often looking directly at you, which is some form, at least signals to a viewer that there is perhaps some form of consent. Um, yeah. Like uh, I didn't know this person, but I really liked how the thing on his head. So I went and asked. Right. And yeah, sorry, Joseph, you were gonna. Uh, no, no, I mean, I'll, you know, I just, I'm just really soaking up this beautiful photograph here. So I'm sorry, I, I'm in a dream right now. <laughs> I'm, you're, I'm right there with you. Um, I, I, you know, I think it has a lot to the way I grew up in the city. Um, I grew up at a time of what was called muscle journalism, right? Muscle journalism was, you know, Pete Hamill, and, you know, so many writers like him where, you know, back then when you were a news reporter, you had to go out and get the news. You had to do the man on the street. You had to sort of talk to people, you know, and, you know, that old Ouija style, that old photo league style of kind of walking the streets, but talking to people, you know. And now we're in this in the age of street photography and Instagram where people don't do. I mean, I just spent 15 weeks talking about this with my NYU students, but, you know, it. You, you know, take time and listen and, and maybe you don't get the photograph, right? Maybe you don't, maybe you don't. Now, I also studied with Alex Webb and many, many other great sort of people out there in the world of, 
you know, for example, when Alex Webb was working in the streets of Mexico City, I would see him when I was working there and he would work one block for a week, walk around that one block for a week. Everybody thinks, sees the pictures and thinks like, wow. So the commitment was something that I learned, which became important for me to learn how to engage with the public and with the private. And so, you know, and I wanted to look at people that look like me. I mean, I was always, because as a child with my mom, we would never get a yellow cab, Drew. They would never stop for us. So we had to do what was just said, you know, we had to use the car service. We had Black Pearl, which was an African-American car service before Uber. So it was only driven in Harlem or in East New York or in Williamsburg. So this disconnection, you know, with the racial divide, the prejudice, which was very prolific here, I went to a Catholic school. I was, me and an African-American boy were the only minorities in the whole school of 500 kids right here on Carroll Street in Park Slope, right? And that was, that was just like, it was clear. You know, it was like a West Side Story neighborhood here, right? You stayed there, we stayed here. But when I went to high school, I was a humanist. I embraced everybody. I met Asian friends and Black friends and white friends. And, and that was the beauty of New York. So that's the way I try to look at the city but, you know, if we talk about representation and when I move on later on and I'm, I'm starting to begin to do the gentrification of East Harlem, which is a school project in black and white, you know, of course, we're, we're, we're introduced to Bruce Davidson's East 100th Street uh, thousands of times. I met Bruce Davidson. I showed him my color work as well. You know, we had a very nice conversation. But. I mean, the editors, I mean, you know, this is a whole nother different kind of conversation, but the editors, the curators, everybody would always say, you know, the reference Bruce. So now here I am coming my own voice, right? And I spent five years photographing in Spanish Harlem because I tended to, and it started out on the streets. There's a lot of street photography in Spanish Harlem, but I felt it was important to knock on the door and get in, get inside and get to see what the families were like. And so, you know, and then when National Geographic ran the growing up in East Harlem, just an amazing story, May 1990, 26 photographs, you know, the proudest day of my life. I walk into the, to the public library on 110th Street in, in East Harlem and there's two Puerto Rican boys sitting there looking at the magazine. They're so proud because their name is Rodriguez on the cover. Then I go to National Geographic for another job and then they stay they fired the editor, Bill Garrett, over, over not just East Harlem, he was doing the Exxon oil spill, he was doing AIDS in Uganda, he did the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, he was trying to grab a younger audience. Several of the editors said to me at that time, we should not be doing stories about poverty in America. But you all, now the big discussion that you're probably a part of, right, is this colonial prism that has been used throughout decades, if not almost, you know, many, many years of National Geographic. So now I have editors tell me I get a job to go to Mauritius, which I do a good job for them. And they're telling me, don't give us any dark images. Don't give us any, you know, things that make people look bad. I mean, you know, I just went on to photograph myself. And then after that, and this is very important for me, I had a career, I knew I could have had a career with Geographic. They loved my photography. They loved what I was doing. I had a great editor, Susan Welchman, an old New York City editor. And after that, I just never did a Geographic story again. I went to East Los Angeles after that and spent another 20 years photographing. So I think what's important for the audience to know about this photographer is that I don't work fast. I am a turtle. I work really, really, really slow. And, you know, I, 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 I see the mistakes, I go back because my, my, as a humanist, what's important to me is the connection to the human being. Even if I'm on the street, I talked to this guy with the hat that, that's up there now. I said, I want to thank you very much for letting me take your photo. You know, I hope you're okay. And then boom, I left. You know, I you can't do that all the time in street photography, but, you know, uh, I've seen Gary do it many times, you know, in films. So, you know. Uh, 
Yeah. So, I mean, the conversations that we're having today about representation and where we are, I mean, I, 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 I did this all solo for a long time. Ask Anel Franco, another great photojournalist documentarian from the New York Times who just retired. The first Puerto Rican ever to work in an, in, as a, as a, that I knew as a photographer, photojournalist for the Daily News and then went on. So we had a lot of sort of things to carry in the back pocket that we had to sort of move through. And so... This is some of that as we're looking at a taxi, yeah. But there was also a lot of things going on in the city, Drew. You know it well. You know it well. Layla knows it well too. I mean, we had AIDS just right around the corner. It was dark. I mean, I'm I'm sitting in a cab with an individual, and he comes out of the club, and I said, "You have a good night." And he's all sad. He's going home lonely. You know what's going on? Well, I party for three, four days. You know something bad was going to happen, and then it happened. And then there was no hope for, and I photographed that venture up in East Harlem with no medicine, no nothing, no. So a lot of, I, I can't help it. I'm a Latino who happens to be very emotional. I, I, I take pictures from my heart, not from my brain. So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think what comes through with both of your work is this sort of, as you were saying, this sort of commitment to the, to the right, where, where if it's project-based or whatever it is, or in some cases, family, uh, this sort of commitment to the people that you're that you're photographing uh, over a long term, um, which but also to our city, also to the right. city, because you know I got the New York School right here, right here. Helen Levitt, Louis Fowler, Luigi Saul Leiter. I mean, they're all here. Richard Abaddon, early early Diane Arbus with a thirty five. I mean, you know, you I'm I'm religious when it comes to photography, so you know <laughs> these are my Bible saints, so to speak. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think, you know, you were saying, obviously, we've been talking about the sort of critiques about representation, um, about who, who controls it, who is the authority, um, the sort of frameworks for representation, which I think, of, of course, have been around for a while, but were fairly marginalized, either within academia or within sort of certain circles, but they've really sort of spread, which is obviously a great thing that we're having, that more mainstream publications, spaces are having these conversations or being forced to at least have the conversations if they, if they didn't willingly, um, if it still took sort of decades to do that. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that's, um, it's all a good thing. I mean, you know, I'm sort of interested also um, maybe sort of building off that, thinking about um, both of your work and then coming back again to Wintergrand and this, this tension between, uh, right, the photograph as a document uh, and the photograph as uh, a, a, an ambiguous picture, right? It's, it, it is a document of a thing that does exist and the camera did record it. Um, but of course it, it is a two-dimensional, in most cases, right, a two-dimensional, print or, or something we see on a screen um, that, that is an image, right? That has some sort of relationship to the world, but also can't in full ever explain, describe what uh, the full context of where that picture came from, which I think is sort of what you were getting at through one, through this sort of commitment to um, the, the people that you're, you're photographing, the, the city, the subject matter, um, but also, um, yeah. So I didn't. Yeah. I wondered if, if your thoughts about about that and that sort of is that attention that you sort of welcome? Is it attention? I mean, um, you know, I, I think, of course, there's a lot of photographers that that include a lot of text to frame their photographs, to make sure that the meaning is fixed, to provide the context for the viewer in a way that they feel is uh, responsible. Um, um, and uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious about your own your own, the way you approach um, this tension? Well, I mean, I, I just love being a photographer. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, I just love, I mean, a taxi cab is, is yeah, and that's the vehicle that makes me want to do the work, right? But, you know, I mean, I'm looking, I love light. I mean, everything. I mean, I love the face, the human, I mean, everything about photography, I just love. I mean, it. so, I uh, and as a student, you know, we, we are, we are um, uh, suggested, is suggested to us to try many different things. Yeah. So um, I'm also shooting color at this time, trying to be like 
Gary once again and see if I can get into Sports Illustrated. But but I, I kind of like just looking at the voyage. That's if we're going to put this into one word, that's what this is. This is Joseph Rodriguez's voyage. And that was the title of the book, actually, is the same title of the Blur magazine that Fred Richin and Robert Blake, who were my teachers at the time at ICP, the student publication was called Taxi Journey Through My Windows, right? Because I was so frustrated, all I could do was photographing, photograph, because I kept it going after school, but I, I, I just could photograph what I ate, that little frame, you know, so I wanted, I had, it came up with the title, but it's really, really about the voyage. You know, because I've got Plusu in my head. I've got so many photographers that are here. I got Sergio Lorraine in my head. I mean, it's just a lot of people that, that you know, can I breathe? Can I make my own frame, right? So, yeah, I, I tried many, many things. So this, this is the edit we put together. And help? obviously you, you've often worked in a book format, which... Um, through right sequencing of photographs at least provides a larger context for a project than an individual. Um. Well, I got I got very bored with photojournalism. I mean, I do it because you know I, I believe in story. I'm a narrative type photographer. Uh, that comes from cinema for me because as a bo young boy, I spent too many days in the cinema. I was like, me, Woody Allen, I met him one time and we had a joke about that because Woody would do cinema, cinema, cinema all the time. It's me too. So I learned a lot of things from the screen. And so I just wanted to keep this, this, this window of, of the camera lens, the 28 millimeter, the 24 millimeter, the 35 millimeter as, as a cinema screen, right? So, and I'm learning also Sidney Lumet who always would talk about lenses. Good photographers need to know, cinematographers, you need to know your lens, right? So how are we going to put things into context? So, you know, this corner, this picture right now, you know, maybe I took four or five frames, right? And just a little later on, on the same block, the Fiorucci model starts walking down, the, the girl and the woman in the white dress, right? And so, you know, I, I'm, but I'm working as fast as Gary because I need to make money. So it's quick, quick, quick. Can I see? But when you look, when you live a, a place, you get to know it well. It's like the way we take the subway. You know every corner. You know every, you know. So you you pick things up quite quickly. But I was doing a hell of a lot of homework back then. You know, studying a lot of photography. So um, you know, trying a lot of different things. But looking at the city, this voyage. And Sasha, I'm curious. Your I mean, obviously, you just published your first monograph which mm -hmm. provides a larger context for, for your work, especially for people who might've just seen bits and pieces published or exhibited before. Um, so yeah, I'm curious about that. What that process is of sort of um, framing your work together in that way. And like I was saying, this tension between the, the, the photograph as a document and the photograph as this, this ambiguous picture um, that, that exists only within right, the confines of that frame. Yeah. I think I'm much like Winogrand in the sense that I shoot and 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 then I will have like a hundred sheets of four by five film that I got to develop and like 56 rolls of like 120 film I have to develop. It's like the shooting, uh, Gary, I looked at, I remember this quote is I photograph to see what things photograph or to see what the world looks like photograph or something along those lines there. Mm -hmm. And it's true that, um, the photograph does become a of mediation for understanding the world because when you still the world in a certain way, you're able to, you know, look at it and ask more questions of it. And I think for me, the question of like the documents versus the, the picture itself is like, if you use a camera and take a photograph, you're photographing something that was placed before the camera's eye. The question of documentation or record has to do with who who designates what is a record, who designates what is a document, and then who provides the context for the truth of that document. I think that's what I've been trying to work through. It, you know, like for me, this is both a document and a photograph. Like, I don't know where this street is. I'm sure this Mangoes is not there anymore. Like, I'm thinking about all of the things that I'm seeing in this photograph. It, it like, but then it's the picture itself. It's the whites of the man's eyes. It's the 
it's his lips, it's his nose, it's the woman behind him that's like in motion, you know, and then you think of your friend's grandmother that did the thing with the thing and then, you know, so it's like both. But again, like records, documents are, a, have to do with who designates that and photographs, like what Joseph was saying is like the, the obsession, the, 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 the desire to see the thing as a photograph, the desire to still the moment. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, you saying that reminds me again, you know, what I was saying about Wintergrand, right? And, and the sort of framing, especially with Tchaikovsky of this idea of in the exhibition, new documents, right? That, that, that Wintergrand, Friedlander, Arbus were making false documents, right? They were making photographs that looked like documents, but were not documents. But I think, you know, one of the things that we can do now when looking at these photographs is realize them as, of, well, of course they are records of, New York City, say in the 1960s. Yeah. And so, yeah, we can look at the individuals and even if we don't know their name or we might recognize some people actually, you know, I was when the color show was on view at the Brooklyn Museum, a woman, I was giving a tour and a woman came in and she goes, that's me. You know, like that was a document of her when she was a teenager in New York City. Um, or, or, pe yeah. or people, you know, of course, like, you know, I think so many people are fascinated by Winogrand's work now in the color show, especially through the fashion, right? It's a document of the way in which people dressed in New York City in the 50s and 60s. And I think that 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 was also fun for me to see people walk in and just talk about, you know, the way in which people really dressed up when they went out, or at least in Midtown, right? He's photographing in specific areas and spaces where people were dressed a certain way when they were in, in public. Um, and, and right, so it's, it's documents of fashion, it's documents of so many, so many things, even if at the time, um, you know, there was, there was a desire to push or push back against the photograph as an actual document. Um, but, you know, you can't help but bring the document back in, even if, even if we attempt to if, uh, you sort of banish it. Um, I think we were going to try to have time for questions, but I, I, I think we need a translator here for <laughs> if there are questions in the chat. I'm not, I'm not sure. But if not, we can, um, we're, also, we're also now over an hour, which we were going to, oh, Carlos is coming. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. Hi, hi. Well, we don't have uh, many questions, so you have, uh, maybe two or three minutes if you want to finish. Uh, if not, thank you so much. Drew, Joseph, Sasha has been a pleasure have you this afternoon with us. Very interesting and rich conversation. And besides, Winona has been great, know a little about your work. So maybe if you, if you want to speak, uh, just one more question for them, it will be enough. We have a question that, uh, uh, pardon, uh, uh, Good, I'm going to speak in Spanish now. There's a question for us, really. Somebody was wondering the, about the difference between the exhibition that we prepared on Winnow Grand in 2015 and this show. The one in 2015 was a project of the uh, MoMA that we presented in Madrid. And it was, there are many pictures that were in that show and that are also in this show because they're pictures, key pictures of Winogrands. And, um, but the curators are obviously different and the projects are obviously different in the way they've been presented. The, the clearest difference between the 15 show and this show is that for the first time in Spain, now we're going to present the uh, color photography of uh, Gary Winogrand. And there had been no Winogrand exhibition in Barcelona since 1991. It was organized by the Tapies organization and a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. And it is very good for the new generations to see Winogrand again. And uh, well, I don't know whether there are any final questions, no. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank Tremendously you. thankful to, your, to, to you for your chat, your conversation, fascinating. And I want to remind you that on Tuesday next, at the same time, we have a new conversation to close the series of lectures of this year. 
which will be uh, Nicholas Dixon and Laura Tare on the exhibition of the Brown Sisters that we present together with Winogrand's exhibition at the Space 2 of the KBR. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both as well. And Carlos, thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Drew. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Sasha. It's been great to meet you all. Um, hopefully we can keep talking. Yes, I hope so. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was really awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.